Our first company for today is BPH Energy, trading under the ASX code BPH with a market cap of 27 million. They are a diversified company holding investments in biotechnology and resources. BPH holds a significant interest, 36% in unlisted oil and gas exploration company, Advent Energy Limited. Joining us today is BPH MD and Executive Director, David Breeze. Welcome back, David, and over to you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I'm going to speak today on uh, the three entities in which we have uh, significant investment, Advent Energy, Clean Hydrogen Technologies and Cortical Dynamics. I'll speak mostly about Advent Energy and thank you for the opportunity to present. If we can go to the next slide, please. In October of last year, uh, Minister King, uh, the Resources Minister, initiated a, an inquiry into the future gas strategy for Australia. Australia is actually in the midst of uh, an energy supply crisis, and that's best illustrated by uh, these developments just in the last couple of months, as you see. The Australian editorial said that gas is critical to keeping lights on, and whilst the government has done a, a deal with uh, certain suppliers to keep uh, power stations going for the next five years. Um, Bass Strait is in the middle of a 50% reduction in uh, gas supply, and that's occurring over last year, year before, and through this year and through into the next couple of years. Bass Strait has supplied all of the gas that has need, been needed for uh, Eastern Australia for, uh, for the uh, demand purposes for the last 60 years and has used six TCF to do so. But uh, in a 50% reduction of supply capacity, that's a problem. Now we're seeing the energy issues uh, that the uh, grids on a knife edge, we had in December households asked to reduce electricity usage. In January, we had uh, the same energy market operator uh, request to to moderate demand in Queensland. We had uh, a gas interruption in uh, Northern Territory and uh, households were blacked out. And then we had uh, blackouts in uh, Victoria. And in 2022, of course, we had a major blackout and they had to act actually control demand of gas in uh, Victoria. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the AEMO, which is the uh, Australian Energy Market Operator, has put out a, a draft integrated system plan. There's a really important point within that, uh, and that is that uh, they now predict that there will be 16 gigawatts of uh, gas-fired power required by 2050. Last year, they said it was 11 gigawatts of uh, gas-fired power by 2050, and we're already using 10 to 11 gigawatts of uh, gas-fired power at the moment. In other words, the need for gas uh, in the system isn't going to go away. If I can go to the next slide, please. Um, when Deezer put out the consultation paper, uh, they forecast that uh, there would be an 800 petajoule a year shortfall out to 2034. However, that shortfall starts to kick in from 2026-27 and grows substantially. I'm about to go to the next slide, and when I do that, I'm going to give you context uh, to that demand um, and supply issue. If we can go to the next slide. If you look at Tasmania, South Australia, Northern Territory, Victoria, uh, in fact, and part of Queensland's uh, total use, that's about 800 petajoules a year. In other words, you either shut off all domestic supply or you supply the external contracts that where uh, Australia supplies up to 40% of Japanese uh, LNG power requirements. And you can't have uh, that type of uh, of energy constraint onto the uh, major domestic, uh, sorry, the major international companies 
uh, countries, which includes, of course, uh, Singapore, South Korea, uh, Japan, and uh, they significantly um, have emphasised the uh, risk in terms of Australia's uh, reputation in terms of shutting off that supply. So new supply is uh, critical. If I can go to the next slide, please. There is not sources in the international LNG. In fact, if you look at the red line, uh, the uh, supply won't meet the international uh, demand either. So now I'll go to the next slide. Um, when I talked about the Northern Territory gas supply issue, the, uh, they had to shut down the pipeline that took uh, gas from the Northern Territory and into the Eastern States. And uh, that has occurred again in the recent past. In fact, a business has now gone out of uh, uh, producing helium in the uh, Northern Territory, and that's one of at least three or four businesses that have shut down or had to change their uh, production processes. And that includes uh, Mollycop in Newcastle, Sealy, which has just announced closure, a factory closure in uh, Northern Victoria, and Orica, which has just announced that they're going uh, to uh, the USA for uh, a new project because they can't get the gas that they require within the Australian uh, market system to be able to supply them. Now, they're all uh, broad issues, and that takes us to the importance of PEP11. Next slide, please. Um, so there are only two permits in New South Wales that are capable of meeting the further supply of uh, gas. And other than that, New South Wales has no other sources of domestic uh, supply. And of course, uh, Queensland is fully, very largely committed to those LNG exports. Next slide, please. So um, 5.7 TCF in targets, in structural targets, 26 kilometres off Newcastle, new gas-fired power stations going into New South Wales. Next slide, please. This is a gas project. It's a gas project because the vitronite maturity as illustrated in this slide is such that uh, only gas is really capable of being produced out of this area. And that's a critical point in terms of people who are attempting to mislead the public by saying it's an oil project. It's not, it's gas. Next slide, please. Um, the... Structural target is at uh, 2,000 metres and it's about uh, 20 square kilometres. It's a significant target. That alone could, in fact, meet a significant uh, uh, requirement of uh, New South Wales in the success case. Next slide, please. So uh, not only is it uh, potentially able to be used for uh, gas supply but also for carbon capture and storage, but also in the investment that we have, and I'm about to speak briefly about in hydrogen, has the capacity to actually produce both hydrogen and carbon into the um, domestic supply situation. So next slide, please. I move to uh, clean hydrogen technologies, and um, uh, we made an announcement in the last uh, week or so uh, we're in an investment which is now producing turquoise hydrogen and clean carbon black. Uh, it has no other CO2 emissions within it. And the clean carbon black is what I'm going to stress in this next uh, couple of moments. Next slide, please. That announcement showed that we were, they've gone from proof of concept to production and it's low level of production at the moment. But here's the key to understanding the value enhancement here. We're producing carbon nanotubes and alumina uh, as a composite. And the mechanical properties is that it's a toughening agent. It's a high tensile strength, conductivity greater than copper, and a thermal dissipation greater than diamonds. It resists corrosion and fatigue. It can be used in batteries. It can be used 
in um, uh, military applications, in plastics, in paints. Uh, so it has a very wide degree of knowledge, and that's because of the unique uh, features of the product that we're producing. Next slide, please. And it's, this is the final slide bar, the uh, disclaimer. Uh, cortical Dynamics has moved through FDA. We're at the moment in the process of having uh, our Gen 2 upgraded. We already have Gen 1, that is the software, hardware, firmware and uh, screens approved in both FDA, CE, TGA and the Korean marketplace. And we're in the process of having the enhancements or the move through into Gen to Generation 2 now upgraded for supply into those marketplaces. Um, I'll finish at that point because I think I've used up my allotted 10 minutes and uh, move to question time. Thanks very much. Uh, through David, thank yeah, that's lovely. Thank you very much. Bang on time. Much appreciated. And actually, there's a few questions around the, the hydrogen corp. So the first one up, you know, you now own 10% of clean energy, uh, uh, clean hydrogen corp. And you also have the ability to acquire, uh, acquire another further 10%. What is the company's strategy going forward with this investment? So um, we actually have a, an equity interest in uh, a 19.5% across both BPH and Advent. We have already signed and announced the uh, potential to use that gas uh, to produce both hydrogen and uh, this carbon composite in the uh, Northern Territory with our project up there. Um, and of course, energy is a key requirement in the area where we are up in the Northern Territory. But we have the potential to be able to use that technology in the uh, New South Wales area. And of course, hydrogen is a key component of uh, uh, the energy transition moving forward. Now, uh, not only that, of course, we have the capacity to get a substantial value uplift because hydrogen, of course, is uh, needed and the uh, market in this is significant across the globe. It's a multi-billion dollar marketplace. Next question, please. And next one is, is on the same sort of topic. Is there a time a timeline for clean energy to build, test and produce from the reactor as yet? Uh, yes. So, in fact, their initial system, they've, they've just outgrown their uh, current plant area. That is uh, in terms of both footprint and uh, vertical height, because as you move up in production capacity, your, your system gets taller and you move from something like four metres up to uh, seven metres. So we're in the process of uh, identifying and uh, moving to a new site there. And we have an objective of moving into uh, that scaled up production within this year. And one just come in here, you know, could you comment on the medical technology side of the business and how does that fit into the portfolio? And again, we have uh, just under a 20% interest in that entity. Uh, and, of course, um, med tech acquisitions occur uh, on a global basis as these companies that have developed technologies and they, they do take time, but, but the med tech acquisitions occur. However, we have already got a, um, an agreement uh, with uh, Philips and Philips have uh, their uh, screens in over 50% of the operating theatres on a global basis. The advantage of that for us is that we only need to be able to supply then the sensors and the uh, software and the firmware and the screen that we utilise there is the Philips screen and the screen is the most significant portion of the acquisition cost for hospitals. So uh, we have the capacity to move both in that uh, um, low cost penetration of markets, as well as where the Philips screen isn't in, in the uh, approximate 50% of theatres around the world, 
and that's you can see that in the strategy that we've just announced the other day. Well, okay, and just to finish up, uh, uh, as of today, what is the status with PEP 11 offshore New South Wales? Both the state government and Commonwealth have a position on this. What do you expect to be the outcome? So we've already um, uh, re- made several releases on this and we don't have an update beyond that. We do know that NOPTA made a recommendation to the Joint Authority in October of last year. That recommendation, again, we know from public um, statements by Minister King, is with the uh, departments that she administers. And we are currently waiting for the Joint Authority to sign off on the NOPTA recommendation. David, as always, absolute pleasure. Many thanks for taking part today. Thanks indeed.